this morning is chaired by uh, Dr. Alicia Kidd, who is lecturer in modern slavery at the Wilberforce Institute and chair of the Humber Modern Slavery Partnership. Um, just a reminder to all the audience members to put your uh, questions for our speakers today in the chat so that um, Alicia can, can keep track of them there. Okay, um, if you're there, Alicia, I can't see you at the moment. You could make yourself known. There you are, hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> Without further ado, um, we'll have a short break after your panel, but we'll uh, we'll launch into your your session now. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks Sophia. Um, thanks, everyone. Hello and welcome. I'm delighted to have the pleasure of introducing our first panel of the day, who will be speaking to the theme of industries of exploitation. And we have three speakers in this panel, uh, James Kofi Annan, Beth Jackson and Savandi Abaratna. So if I can invite all three of you to share your video so it's as close as we can get to the three of you sitting together at the front of the room. And I'd just invite anybody that's not speaking, if you could just turn off your videos. So our first speaker is James, and James himself was trafficked to Canada's Lake Volta at age six, and he spent seven years working in forced and hazardous labor and modern slavery-like practices in the fishing industry. He escaped and pursued his education and a career and went on to found Challenging Heights, a nonprofit organization in 2005. James served as a board chair of Family for Every Child, Survivor Alliance, the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery's Expert Advisory Council, and is a former UN Financial Sector Commissioner on Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking. James has a master's degree in communication and media studies and a bachelor's degree in psychology. And he also has been awarded an honorary doctorate of letters by Grand Valley University in Michigan, USA. James is going to present his paper on climate change induced migration and modern slavery in the fishing industry in Ghana. And after his talk, we'll have 10 minutes for questions. So please do put your questions in the chat. Okay, James. Are you there, James? Okay, maybe we don't have James yet. Okay, so, um, well then, shall we move on and we'll come back if, if uh, James is able to join us and we'll move on to Beth, if that's okay. Beth, are you there? Brilliant, hi Beth. Okay, um, so Beth Jackson is a, a senior research fellow at the Rights Lab and her work focuses on the nexus between modern slavery, environmental degradation <coughs> and climate change. And her background is in the application of remote sensing to investigate that nexus. And she has experience investigating sectors including agriculture, brick kilns and fisheries. And Beth's current interests lie in the impacts of the nexus in relation to forest ecosystems. Beth's paper is going to be on brick kilns, modern slavery and environmental impl implications. And we'll have 10 minutes afterwards. So um, please put any questions for Beth in the chat. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Alicia. It's nice to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, let me just share. Can I, am I all right to share my screen, if that's all right? Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's saying it's disabled. Sophia, are you able to uh, grant access for that? Oh, there we go. Uh, here we are. It's a nice. Can't, you can't talk about remote sensing without having some nice pictures for you all, I'm afraid. So uh, yeah, it's great to be here this morning uh, with you all. Um, I'm going to do my talk, as Alicia mentioned, around brick kilns, modern slavery and the environmental implications of that. So this is based on my PhD work and then also a lot of work that many other colleagues at the Wright Lab have undertaken. Um, so if there's any technical questions that you're all interested in, I might not be able to answer them, but I'll be happy to um, connect you with uh, Doreen, who leads on the Brick Kiln project at the lab. So um, in terms of the uh, modern slavery environment nexus uh, that we look at in terms of the South Asian Brick Kiln, um, which crosses uh, 13 northern states in India, um, Bangladesh, Nepal, and a bit of Pakistan, um, we look at debt bondage and the impact uh, that's occurring there. 
So as, uh, as it's already been mentioned, there's about 12.2 uh, million people who are connected to environmentally degrading conditions uh, as part of their subjection to modern slavery. And brick kilns are really uh, quite a dominant driver of emissions led uh, modern uh, part of the nexus. So that links to uh, uh, the impacts of climate change through ozone depletion, aerosols, uh, uh, ocean acidification and heating as it absorbs um, emissions that are released um, and then also things like um, uh, pollution within uh, the groundwater and topsoil so there's many connections to multiple SDGs um, not just uh, climate action and life on land but also um, things like uh, no poverty and connections to good health and well-being so it's really important that when we think about um, the brick kilns we think of it as a holistic uh, connection to the environment that can be beyond sort of the the classics of um, the emissions led uh, but also thinking about how those social interactions link so in terms of the brick kilns um, we have a sort of program of action that began with an estimate because there were many um, figures that didn't have a replicable methodologies linked to them of how many brick kilns were located in this region. Um, and from that, we could then map those locations and determine trends over time, which was um, something that NGOs um, and organizations within this region were really um, requesting. And then after we've got that information we can look at environmental assessments for the whole of the region and then provide tailored uh, outputs and information for organizations working in the labor and environmental rights space within those countries so as part of this presentation i'm going to focus on the first three parts um, because we have a program with UNDP India and their accelerator lab that's applying these data that we um, established so in terms of first, uh, the estimation, so we used a robust uh, random sampling method for the whole of the region, as we said, because there was no um, specific methodology that could be repeated by NGOs or CSO organizations um, to try and determine the number of kilns. And without knowing the number of kilns that you might be looking at, you don't really know the scale of the problem from an environmental or a social perspective. So this was all manual. I spent many, many months uh, trolling through Google Earth imagery um, available or uh, openly available. It doesn't have any of the, the technical um, analysis behind it. It was simply random sampling and scrolling through um, the Google Earth Pro. So essentially when you use Google Maps and you click on the satellite image, it was that uh, data that we were using. So it's free and openly available and anyone can do this. Um, so we sampled and found uh, and, and identified more than a thousand kilns within this area, within these areas of samples, which we could then use for training data um, to uh, automate the process. Because um, if I was doing this still, we'd still be, we'd still be here um, trolling through imagery. So <laughs> when we scaled up the um, number of kilns that were located in these sample sites, we estimated that there were around uh, 55,000 kilns with plus or minus 10,000 uh, within the region. Um, and that was really helpful because it gave us a, a, a basis on which to work um, on how big the problem of debt bondage may be uh, within the kilns and how big the environmental impact in terms of emissions might be. But obviously they were all very estimate based. So we then applied uh, a machine learning approach called a convolutional neural network, you only look once approach. So all of those coordinates of the kilns that we had, we could take those images and rotate them around. So we had multiple uh, images for the training. Um, rather than just the 1000, you could turn one image of a kiln into like 10 or 20 images of a kiln because the kilns are all um, located uh, in different angles, um, but they all have this distinctive shape and size, which is which makes it a really good case for um, applying machine learning techniques. So we were able to um, train an algorithm to identify these kilns um, and apply it across the whole across satellite imagery for the whole of the brick belt. And then you may have seen that Landsat 9 launched the other day, but this is the latest in a series of satellites that NASA um, operates uh, from the States um, and we have 50 years worth of data. So because we have this large archive of data available, we were able to take our location mapping and apply a series of 
uh, techniques called breakpoints. So it could identify if there was a change in the reflectance of the image. So one uh, one year it may reflect um, the same wavelength as say a field of grass and then there would be a change in the next year and it would uh, reflect what we would detect as a brick kiln. So you would be able to see that in 1994 it was a field and in 1995 there had been a change. Um, and that was really important because it gives us this time series on which that we can then backcast and look at changes in land cover, in pollution and emissions uh, and then once we know that, we can detect where potential changes may be in the future. Um, so that gave us a spatial and uh, temporal data set with which to work. And from that, we applied a series of different environmental um, assessments. So the first was using a land cover assessment. Um, so that was looking at the locations of the kilns and where it may be in conflict, because obviously the kilns use a vast amount of uh, 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 natural extraction of resources, particularly topsoil and um, and water. So from the maps, uh, again from satellite data, we were able to map on top of uh, the locations and found that more than 80% of the kilns uh, are located on agriculturally productive land, which makes sense because they need good quality topsoil. But what's really important there is that it puts it in direct conflict with SDGs around health and hunger, around food security, and particularly with the emissions and the absorption of uh, heavy metals into soil and uh, water supplies that can have a knock-on effect um, uh, around uh, things like uh, uh, stomach conditions, um, the quality of food that are being grown, crop failures, that kind of thing. So it's really important that we note that these are occurring in similar locations. And you can see how close they are occurring. Um, so you can see the brick kilns themselves right next to, um, they take off obviously a vast, it's more than just the size of the kiln. It's a swath of land around that for the uh, production, drying, uh, and drying of the bricks. You see all those straight lines um, of all the, br of the bricks that are being dried. But then there's also the location right next to um, fields where agriculture are occurring. And that proximity means that those that aren't compliant environmentally um, can have a detrimental impact. And also those that are located right around um, uh, large urban settings, for example, um, obviously contrib contributing to larger amounts of emissions um, and the issues that go um, with living in a large urban area. So probably as to be expected, as the, as the number of kilns increase, um, the number of resources also increase. There was a leveling off of the number of kilns that were identified around 2017, 2018. Uh, we do have a more up-to-date uh, data set now, so we can rerun the, re these analyses. Um, but obviously there's a vast amount uh, more of topsoil that have been, is, has been extracted um, compared to groundwater due to the ratios used, but it's still um, large numbers of um, um, natural extractive resources that are required uh, for these processes. And then it's not just groundwater supplies that are being impacted, but also rivers, um, depending on the proximity of the brick kilns themselves to um, water sources, depending on which uh, sources that they are using uh, within their production. And then there's also a lot of satellite data that enables us to track uh, emissions. Um, we can't see it at the same level of detail as we would with um, optical data that's looking at things directly on the ground. Um, and as a lot, many of the brick kilns are located around urban settings, it can be hard to differentiate between emissions that are general from cars, um, factories, uh, to those that are specifically from brick kilns, but it gives us a good start of where there may be peak um, uh, areas uh, of interest to look at. So we've looked at things like uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and then PM 2.5 concentrations, which is the map here. Um, we can see they're highly focused around uh, Delhi, which is where all the bright red, uh, uh, um, more than 100 parts per million 
uh, PM 2.5 is located, and that's obviously really important for health indicators because PM 2.5 is one of the leading causes of lung conditions, um, early onset asthma, um, and that those kind of health impacts from emissions themselves, but also they contribute to the, the collection of um, greenhouse gases that are impacting on uh, climate change. Um, so what we really need here is ground data um, to help identify areas so we can look at it from and support that with satellite data and um, to see the scale and directly attribute uh, emissions to brick kilns. And then theoretically, if, uh, you know, everyone who is in debt bondage uh, in a kiln was located in a single kiln, and we know that's not necessarily the case, um, we could, could remove around 10,000 uh, kilns from the system that were operating in an environmentally or um, socially uh, illegal manner. Um, obviously, there are a number of uh, those who may be working in kilns that uh, would want to uh, continue working in a kilns, but in a liberated sense, and that's something that needs to be accounted for in any just transition that occurs. Um, but you could see um, a vast reduction in the amount of environmentally degrading impacts that come from kilns if you were to um, see debt bondage um, ended within the brick mine. Fantastic, Beth. Thank you so much. So interesting. Um, I think the last time we met was when you were in the middle of data collection. Um, and as someone only, who only deals with qualitative research and I just don't understand numbers, it's, it's really, really interesting to hear about this work um, that obviously affects not only human beings and social justice, but the climate. Um, so we have got some questions coming in for you, if I can put them to you. Um, the first one is, are you working with any microfinance groups to identify owners or workers in brick kilns and to help ensure they're sustainable and com compliant? Um, I don't believe that we are currently working with any microfinance groups. I think UNDP India might, but I, um, I'm not sure that any of those currently working on the project are, so I will mention that to them. <laughs> I'll be like, you should be looking at microfinance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know it's been done in the Cambodian brick kilns. I know um, quite a few folks at um, Royal Holloway who were looking at those have been, they were looking at the impact of microfinance um, but yeah, it's not something that we've looked at at the Rice Lab, I don't think. Okay, no, that's really interesting. And it's interesting to hear that in Cambodia, there's similar work going on and almost mm -hmm. maybe in a, a different way. So some learning exercises there between the two countries. Um, one thing I wanted to ask was how much do we know about the impacts of brick kilns on the local water sources? So obviously you're saying that, that it is impacting water sources, but do we know anything about how it's affecting those water sources and the people who are using the water? Um, so in terms of the general impacts, it tends to be from the heavy metal um, emissions. So um, when the pollutants settle, um, they can be absorbed into the ground and the, wa and the water supply in that way. Um, so in the same way that it would from, um, you know, a coal-fired power station, if they didn't have the right filters in, it would be, it would be quite similar. Um, we haven't done any specific groundwork um, uh, on whether that would be uh, what the what the levels are and how it's impacting. I know there are quite a few um, studies conducted by um, local scholars within India and also in Bangladesh that have looked at this problem. Um, so there's definitely research out there, and we used a lot of that um, that research to inform um, our. Um, estimates around the environmental um, impacts because we obviously we were doing quite a bit of it during the pandemic so we couldn't actually go out there um, but yeah I think it's mainly through um, ground absorption um, and then it filtering through the system um, but yeah I think there's definitely some good studies that I can pull out if you're um, further interested just drop me an email I'll drop my email in the chat afterwards um, and I can I can dig out what we were using great that's fantastic thank you and we've got two more questions in the chat, so I'll um, ask you those. I'll ask you one by one because I know if you're anything like me, you'll forget the first question. Yeah. Time <laughs> um, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, so the first question is from Tom Griffiths and he asks, uh, there have been disadvantages in the closure and removal of outdated or uneconomic manufacturing processes in the north of England and more developed nations, such as in mining and the textile and engineering industry. 
with so-called left behind communities. Are these disadvantages addressed in the brick belt proposals? Um, so that is a good point. Um, <laughs> I'm going to copy these uh, questions, I think, and, uh, and just be like, Doreen here. Um, so uh, we've not addressed it directly. There's plans in the monitoring um, source to um, identify those kilns which appear no longer active. They're currently just lumped in with all of the kilns. We can now differentiate between Bulls Trench and Zigzag, but I think the next step is to identify those that um, appear no longer active, so whether they're derelict. Um, we often see that a kiln will pop up um, and then another kiln will spring up beside it um, and then the first one will become derelict and no longer active. So it appears that rather than the industry just disappearing, it just moves to a different um, type of system and there's also a lot of migration. Um, so oftentimes workers in brick kilns will work in the brick kiln for the season and then they'll go back to agriculture. So there's a lot of um, movement between sectors. I don't think brick kilns are in the same way that mining in northern England was just decimated. I think there's a bit more of a movement towards environmentally not sustainable but slightly more environmentally compliant and thoughtful um, practices. Um, which perhaps is where we should have gone in the north of England um, rather than just getting rid of them all. But I think um, when we're thinking about the just transition, that's something that definitely needs to be addressed. I don't think getting rid of the sector as a whole is, in, is imperative. I think it's thinking about reducing emissions or thinking about different manufacturing ways that aren't just extracting of topsoil um, and groundwater, thinking about how um, you know, folks in those countries are developing new technologies, how can that become more common and widespread? Brilliant, thank you. And then a final question for you. Do you have any data on the impact of, the, of climate change on those involved in brick kiln work and the impact on communities affected by slavery in the brick kiln industry? Um, so that's, I think, where our heat stress work that we're currently undertaking is going to come in. So that's, uh, so a colleague of mine is leading on that. Um, and they're working with a climate modeler who's uh, written things for like the COP reports and the IPCC and things. And he has a lot of data around um, changing climate conditions um, and climate modeling. And so we're combining the two um, data sets. So hopefully in the next um, in the next few months, we should have something that has um, it, that draws together that impact between the two um, a bit more, uh, hopefully. Uh, usefully so yeah if you want to drop me an email I can I can connect you with um, Edgar who's leading on that project. Brilliant thanks Beth and thanks okay. for such great answers to great questions and for a fantastic paper as well. Um, yeah really great questions really enjoyed them. I'll do the because we can't clap because you can only really hear one person at a time there is an emoji to clap if anybody would like to. Okay, um, uh, so just thank you very much and um, we'll move on to our next speaker who who I hope is James, James, are you here to present? It's James or Enoch, or either of you here? Yes, have you here? Hello. Hi, James. Hi. Hi. Um, Okay, so if I can just do a quick introduction to James. Um, I, I already read out your, your very impressive and harrowing bio, but if I can just introduce you that you're going to present your paper on climate change induced migration and modern slavery in the fishing industry in Ghana. And that's gonna be 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll have five to 10 minutes for questions. So if anybody has any questions, please add them into the chat. Thanks very much, James, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And now I would have to apologize sincerely for uh, joining late. Uh, there's a miss out. I think the time um, was misconstrued to be a Ghana time, but I think it's uh, in an European time. So uh, we had to fix another meeting in between. So I'm so sorry for joining late. Um, so climate induced migration and modern slavery in the fishing industry in Ghana. And uh, my presentation is going to 
center on um i would give a brief introduction of the topic um i'm sorry i cannot be on video uh but i'll give a brief introduction of the topic then i'll touch briefly on migration modern slavery in ghana and uh, then i'll come to climate change migration and modern slavery nexus uh, then my presentation will move to migration from coastal fishing communities of Ghana. And I'll give an extract from case studies in our recent research. Um, then I'll give a brief of uh, what the role of government, the role of NGOs. And then I'll come to key findings of our uh, research and recommendations. What is the involves all forms of human exploitation against uh, their will under uh, undesired conditions. These forms include, but not limited to slavery, human trafficking, migration, child labor, and so on. Um, as we all know, globally, we have over 40 million people who are victims of modern slavery. Out of this number, the regions with the highest victims are South and Central Asia and South Saharan Africa. Slavery and human trafficking is on the rise. As we know, there has been a strong link between slavery and human trafficking. For instance, in Ghana, uh, our Human Trafficking Act, Act 649, recognized human trafficking as modern slavery. There is this a vicious cycle between climate change, migration, and modern slavery. Migration and displacement are a causal factor to climate change. Climate change impacts human lives, especially through climate-related disasters, which has a bearing on migration and human trafficking. In some, the issues that perpetuate vulnerability of people to modern slavery include climate change, irregular and or labor migration, conflicts among others. 71% of total modern slaves are women and girls. Migration trends related to modern slavery basically takes six trends in Ghana. Migration from coastal fishing communities to middle belt of Ghana. For example, the movement of people from coastal fishing communities of Ghana to the inland lake water area. Not, not south migration of people in Ghana, the movement of people from the most deprived northern areas to major southern cities like Accra, as an adaptation measure against poverty. Migration to mining towns in Ghana, uh, which is mining account for over 40% of Ghana's exports. Small scale illegal mining, that's uh, Galamsi, attracts migrants to mining towns. Migration of other West African nationals to Ghana. The movement of other nationals for work opportunities and begging including child begging on the streets. Migration of Ghanaians and other African nationals to the Gulf states, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates for economic gains, least abuse and slavery. Movement of people to oil producing areas, that's Western region of Ghana. The discovery and the production of crude oil in Western Ghana has induced migration and increased social vices like sex commercialization. Poverty is the most dominant driver of migration in West Africa, including Ghana. Climate change influences poverty by increasing the vulnerability of people through disasters like droughts, flooding, which affects agriculture and makes survival difficult. Therefore, climate change worsens other social factors that causes people to move from their homes, resulting in modern slavery situations. Migration from coastal fishing communities in Ghana is driven by depleting fish stock, resulting from climate change, environmental pollution from plastic waste, and bad fishing methods, including petroleum, use of dynamite, use of chemicals, light fishing, use of tin nets. The Depletion of fish stock leads to increased vulnerability and widening of poverty among fisher folk in coastal Ghana. The migration of people 
from the coastal fishing communities to the inland water lake area is a coping strategy to the declining fishing output. However, fish stock in the des destination area is equally fast declining due to high frequency of fishing activities. Migration, uh, migrant fisher folks from coastal Ghana encounter similar or worse fate of declining fish stock in the destination area, resulting in their entrapment into modern slavery, a confirmation of the visual cycle proposition, a confirmation of visual cycle proposition of Gerard 2018 and O'Connell 2021. Households whose livelihoods depends mainly on fishing become vulnerable to modern slavery, including selling their children into debt bondage. Migrants are unable to return home due to debt bondage or the need to acquire property or just make money. Adults who also borrow money or had their trip sponsored also become victims of modern slavery working in debt bondage. And I would like to give, at this point, give um, um, a couple of case studies. Emisa, that's the name, um, um, anonymous name, a migrant fisherman in sharing his experience on the trend of climate change intimated that, and this one is from our research. In the past, it was easy for us to predict when we would get fish in the sea based on the weather conditions. Usually, August and September were considered the major fishing season. But today, this is not the case because the climate or weather keeps changing. At first, we used to get a lot of fish even without going to the sea. But by just casting our nets at the shore. Today, when you do that, you will not get anything meaningful to even feed your family. The difference between fishing in Winneba and Yeji is the weather condition because we were getting enough fish here at Winneba in the past, but this has now reduced and it is due to the changing weather, climate change, um, and also the use of light fish. Uh, when we say changing weather, we mean the climate uh, change. So I have, I have to migrate to Yeji because there is enough fish there. And because we do not get enough catch from the sea fishing, we have to go to Yeji where there is better catch. Also prices are better at Yeji. So we make more money to support our families back home. Now Kweku, another uh, migrant fisherman observed that due to the poor catch at the sea, Parents find it difficult to take care of their children, so they sell some of the children out in return of money for survival. The trafficker then takes the child to Yeji to work harder for the master, and they are also more treated as well. Sometimes, too, people borrow money from others to travel to Yeji, or even at Yeji, they borrow money from others which they have to pay with interest, but they are are unable to pay. They work for the people in exchange of the repayment. Sometimes they will go home and bring their children to work, uh, to work in their place so that they can repay the loan. Also, because the fisher folk are mostly uneducated, they take advantage of them, making them work for longer periods. And this is even worse if it involves children. And that is Koku speaking. Uh, Children are being sold out because of poverty. And sometimes the traffickers too tell lies that they are going to put the ch child in good school rather than send them to the lake and maltreat them. Some even don't see their parents at all. I was taken to Yeji by my parents when I was a child. There's another one speaking at the last one. For me personally, I was not maltreated while as Yeji because I worked with my parents. But I saw how other children who were not with their parents were treated at the place. It was very bad. They sometimes beat them severely and denied them food. This is Sarah speaking. 
And when you heard me talking about Yeji, I'm referring to the fishing industry around the Volta Lake or Lake Volta in Ghana. What is government doing? The role of government is largely seen in respect of policy formulation and implementation. Development of a national climate change policy in 2014 uh, was done by the government. Another initiative was the development of national climate change master plan action programs for implementation uh, for 2015 to 2020. We also have development of national migration policy of Ghana, which is 2016, and then the launching of the National Plan of Action for the Elimination of Human Trafficking in Ghana, 2017 to 2021. Enactment of the Human Trafficking Act 2005, amended in 2009, and the development of National Social Protection Policy 2015. What are NGOs doing? Um, key strategies for addressing climate change, uh, climate-induced migration from NGOs include the following. Rescuing and rehabilitation of modern slavery victims, especially children from exploitative situations. Reintegration of victims of modern slavery into school and skills training. Sensitization in source destination communities, provision of livelihood options for victims of modern slavery and their parents, conducting research advocacy drives to influence policy programs and to unearth specific context issues in relation to dynamics in migration patterns. Collaborate with state institutions, examples, Ghana Police Service, Department of Social Welfare, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, and collaborate with donor agencies to implement projects on modern slavery. Now, this brings us to our key findings, which um, I believe is important for this discussion. The, the study established a nexus between climate change induced migration and modern slavery in the fishing industry in Ghana. It also established climate change is a stress multiplier that affects other social drivers of vulnerability and poverty. There was a surge in the migration and trafficking of children during the COVID-19 school closure. Government-led response is in the form of policy aimed at addressing the problems that arise from climate change, migration, and modern slavery. And then the private sector, including uh, civil society organizations and NGOs like Challenging Heights, have led initiatives through their local activities in addressing various aspects of the challenge. Our recommendation, we recommend fidelity to the implementation of the provisions of Ghana's national climate change policy on migration, especially those relating to social protection measures and in this institutional mechanisms. We also recommend more synergy, uh, synergic approaches between government and NGOs in the development of support systems for victims of modern slavery. We also recommend holistic and an integrated approach to solving issues of climate induced migration at regional, that is Africa, sub regional levels, West Africa, and then country levels. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, James, for that paper and for sharing your thoughts about it, as well as the recommendations of how we can do better. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions to put to you, if that's okay. And if anyone has any more questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, but one question here, if I can ask this of you, James. In February, three global manufacturing companies expressed concern about the environmental impact of bauxite mining on Attawa Forest. What effect do you think it has when companies speak out this way? I think I didn't understand your question. I didn't get your question. I understood the preamble. So could you please clarify the question, please? Sure. So um, when companies themselves are raising concerns about the environmental impact of mining, do you think that helps towards the drive to um, encourage governments to act? Do you think it's a positive step when, when companies get involved? Yes, that is exact, that's a, a, extremely important for companies themselves to get involved in, uh, in, in the issue. Um, I, 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 and I want to believe that 
when companies raise issues, they are not raising issues out of their own company interest, but out of genuine quest to address the issue of uh, um, uh, climate change and, and, and also to look at their own supply chains and to address uh, the impact of uh, climate change and the vulnerability to modern slavery. Now, if you look at uh, mining, um, in Ghana, the, the one um, biggest, um, I would say, area of concern has to do with artisanal mining, where the, there are no boundaries for how or uh, for the, the extent to which uh, miners can go to destroy the forest and to destroy the environment and and not to replace what they have done and therefore when uh, mining uh, when other companies are raising concerns then uh, they have, it's a legitimate a legitimate concern and it's an opportunity for us as civil society organizations to then hold the companies that are raising issues as well as those who are destroying the environment to to account so it's an opportunity to move in there okay company a you are saying this is what is happening let's join us to address it but first of all let us also look at your own practices and see if we don't have the opportunity to collaborate with you to address your own issues within your supply chains and together with you also help to address the issues that are happening elsewhere and to hold government to account to ensure that the, the policies that have been enacted as I've enumerated in my presentations are implemented and ensure that the laws are being enforced. So perfectly, it is an opportunity for government, uh, for companies to um, uh, raise concerns. And it's the same time also an opportunity for us to take advantage of the concerns that companies have raised to harness their, uh, or to leverage their resources to address the issue of vulnerability. Brilliant, thank you. That's a really comprehensive answer. And you've also actually answered one of the other questions that's been posed to you within that answer. So thanks, Tom, for your question. I hope that the answer's actually covered that. So an another question for you, James. To what extent do you think that people understand that climate change is a factor influencing their situation of exploitation? And how can we raise their voices to demand redress? I would say that in Ghana, the, the linkage or the nexus between my, um, 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 climate change and vulnerability to modern slavery is a very new thing. I will want to believe that our research is um, almost a pioneer one in the area. So there is a need for a lot of um, effort using or leveraging the research to educate the, the public. So to answer the question, to be clear, people do not see climate change as a factor for driving vulnerability to irregular migration and modern slavery. Although some may see it as a factor to driving poverty. Okay, that, that's really interesting. And I think that is um, a really good point from what Sophia was saying at the beginning as to how we might be able to work on this topic going forward. I think there's a, a really key thing you're bringing out there that climate change is a, an impacting factor that's causing modern slavery, but those people who are being exploited don't necessarily identify um, climate change as a factor. So that could be a really interesting research angle there. Thank you. Um, a question from Paul. Is there any link between those persons involved in the fishing in, in modern slavery and the intergenerational element of communities of these people? So can these people at random or specific, or are there specifically vulnerable communities? Um, if I understand the question clearly, um, if there are some of the communities that are both destination and source. 
the, the, the communities around the lake water. Some are both destination and source. But majority of the communities are destination. So the element of um, recycling of uh, vulnerability is there in most of these communities because as per the environment of those communities, all that you know is the fishing and its related abuses. So once you are sold into slavery on the lake, you work for your master for as long as you want. And once you become adult, there's an opportunity for other adult people to set you up in business, in the fishing business, and then recruit other children for you to abuse. So there is uh, all there is uh, this cyclical um, abuse from childhood to adult and for to from adult to abusing others and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm, I've answered the question to the best of my understanding of how the question came. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. There are a few more questions in the chat, but we won't have time to go into them. Um, but there is the option, James, if you wanted to reply in the chat, you could do that. But I'll just say a thank you on everyone's behalf for giving your time to talk to us about your experiences and your understandings and to answer the question so comprehensively as well. So thank you very much. And I'll invite Savandi up next. Um, and Savandi is our, our final speaker. She's a naturalised British citizen, originally from Sri Lanka. And she chose to study Sri Lankan migrant domestic workers for her PhD in social work and social policy at Liverpool Hope University, which for multiple reasons she was unable to complete. But during her PhD, she moved to Sri Lanka, where the ground realities in her ancestral community, her renewed understanding of the political economic context and her research findings led her to found Green Life Generation. She, envi visit sorry, she envisions and runs Green Life Generation as a grassroots social research, sustainable development and alternative education organization, driving bottom up and top down change within a hyper-localized context. So Savandi is gonna present her paper on a holistic grassroots strategic sustainable solution for contemporary slavery and climate change from Sri Lanka. Um, Savandi isn't able to share her video. So I'm going to screen share and um, do her slides for her. But Savandi, if you just let me know when you want me to move on. Yes, and I hope that I don't get disconnected. If I do, please bear with me, I'll reconnect. Great, and are the slides showing? Yes, please go ahead. Great. Uh. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, um, it's a gloomy afternoon here in Sri Lanka, actually, and it feels like I'm back in Liverpool and the Brits are in the tropics looking at the English summer pictures that my friends keep posting on their social media. Um, and I guess it's only at a conference on climate change that uh, talking about the weather to create conversation actually makes sense. Um, but putting my attempts at humor aside, um, this picture is actually where I'm based right now. Um, it is uh, predominantly agricultural, semi-rural um, and industrial and rap rapidly urbanizing area uh, near Kandy in the central province of Sri Lanka. Um, and if there is anyone here who is a fan of cricket, the building you see in the center is the pavilion of the Palakale Cricket Stadium, which is my usual international landmark. Um, firstly, I'm extremely grateful to the organizers for this very timely topic and the opportunity to join the conversation from afar. Um, what I will be doing in the next 10 or so minutes will be a sort of thinking out loud where I will attempt to connect some dots linking theory, policy and practice while politicizing the personal. In this process, I will be presenting Green Life Generation, a private company I founded in 2017 as a holistic grassroots sustainable solution to address climate change and contemporary slavery. So I'm grateful for the years and I look forward to what this encounter may bring. Next slide, please. Um, I will start by locating Sri Lanka in two maps. While as a qualitative scientist, I'm critical about indexes and rankings, I feel this is a good starting point for my story. 
Um, Sri Lanka is an island nation um, in the Indian Ocean and is highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change and has frequented the top 10 ranks of the German watch high rank, high risk countries. At the same time, Sri Lanka also has maintained its position in the tier two watch list of the trafficking in persons report, indicating it is not doing a great job in managing the phenomena of human trafficking, which is considered to entail forms of co coercion and exploitation, characteristic of what is viewed as contemporary slavery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my engagement with the concept of contemporary slavery started about seven years ago with my PhD research into the lives of Sri Lankan migrant domestic workers. These are a group of migrant workers, predominantly women, who travel from Sri Lanka to countries in the Middle East to work in a sector that is highly racialized, gendered, and classed as the dirty work. These women are invisible, devalued, and vulnerable to all forms of abuse and exploitation in their pre-migration, in-service, as well as return reintegration and re-migration stages of their migration cycle. In my research, I was interested in identifying the reasons for their migration decision-making, as well as locations and causes of their vulnerability in order to create recommendations for their recognition, protection, and empowerment. One of the major questions I had to grapple with was, were these women modern day slaves? And are there experiences, ex examples of forced migration and forced labor? Next slide, please. Actually this one. General rhetoric around Sri Lankan migrant domestic workers often places them in the victim position, either from the state who is considered to engage them in the maid trade in exchange for foreign exchange earnings, unscrupulous recruitment agents and middlemen coercing gullible women into migrant labor and good for nothing emasculated husbands who sell their wives for money to squander. While aspects of these statements are true, they also tend to strip these women of their agency, even in the limited spheres of choice they have. What I found was that these women migrate for multiple reasons. In their microspheres, they make a rational decision, sometimes alone or sometimes in consultation with the family to overcome socioeconomic and sociocultural challenges they face in their setting and to achieve personal ob objectives according to a plan they have for themselves and their families. The major drivers leading them to make this high risk decision was their microeconomic situation, which was characterized by inadequate incomes to sustain outgoing and economic insecurity combined with a lack of social safety nets. In most instances, this drove them to unsustainable debts and entrapment in vicious microfinance loan traps, which in the last five, five, few years has led to the death of over 180 women in Sri Lanka by suicide. In retrospect of their experiences, these women are also proud of their contributions and achievements through their transformed role as mobile breadwinners, financially independent members of the family unit and the main foreign exchange earners of the country. Therefore, referring to these women as modern day slaves is kind of disempowering and also demeaning. Taking all these factors into account, my analysis places these women in what Nandita Sharma in her book, Home Rule, National Sovereignty and the Separation of Natives and Migrants, calls the post-colonial New World Order that emerged after World War II. This can be viewed as a, ne a neo-colonial grip maintained by a globalized neoliberal capitalist system of class dominance dominated by financialization, where capital moves freely in search of profit while the mobility of people is restricted through regimes of emigration and immigration regulations. In such a system of controlled mobility, Sri Lanka is strategically placed as a supplier of the global working class. It is both a location for outsourcing production in global supply chains, as well as an agent and source of outsourcing labor for the labor shortages of the world, mostly in devalued categories. This globalized system of exploitation and expropriation has all Sri Lankans under its grip in a form of unfreedom with no immediate way out. So rather than calling this phenomena one of modern day slavery, I swear towards describing it as unfree labor which is more the result of an overarching global superstructure rather than the actions of immoral, unrelated perpetrators. I am no stranger to these unfreedoms myself, but my life changed significantly the day I got naturalized as a British citizen in 2014, removing previous impediments, 
I had to my mobility and clearly showing the operation of these forces and their impacts on people's freedom. With this deep understanding and perspective, I moved to Sri Lanka in 2017, driven by the unfreedom space by my husband in terms of getting a spouse visa for him to come to live in the UK and my unfreedom to have my non-British spouse reside in the UK with me. My move to Sri Lanka after 15 years in the UK threw me into the context I was studying, taking me from a telescope view to a microscopic view, staying put and watching the events around me especially as a social work and social policy student was impossible. I was, uh, next slide please. I was pulled into action straight away. In April, 2017, on the day of the national new year celebrations, one of the main landfills in the country, the Mithotamula garbage dump collapsed, taking the lives of many people unexpectedly. This tragic incident awoke the nation to the implications of the waste problem and prompted youth like me to engage, uh, engage in developmental issues to find ways to address environmental issues holistically. Life in Sri Lanka also confronted me with the impacts of the climate change with frequent run-ins with rain bombs and visible changes in weather patterns over the years. Power cuts are a frequent occurrence during the multiple storms that I have encountered over the last five years. These storms have resulted in floods and massive destruction to the environment, property and lives, while on the other parts of the island, droughts have brought people to their knees. Next slide, please. Green life generation was developed as a knowledge-based, socio-ecological and economic tool in the form of a grassroots research and development company envisioned to be a multi-local, multinational and multi-stakeholder co-op enterprise one day. My aim through the organization is to produce and implement practical solutions to local community issues experienced and identified by, during my PhD research, as well as my post-written reintegration experiences in my ancestral village. I adopted a radical and uh, critical perspective into building this business model as a research-informed bottom-up economic empowerment solution. Next slide, please. The main issues targeted initially were the vulnerability to exploitation and abuse identified from the stories I had collected during my research. Built into this were the local issues linked to the social and ecological domain that emerged in the form of local and global social tensions and environmental challenges. These were experienced in the form of anti-Muslim riots in March 2018 that destroyed my ancestral village and sent the whole country into curfew and social media blackout the Easter bombings of 2019 that brought with it renewed anxieties of ethnic tensions following the 29-year war that Sri Lanka experienced and the present coronavirus pandemic that has led, the biggest, led to the biggest economic crisis the country has ever faced. Within, the con within this context, the work of Green Life Generation can be viewed as an ongoing mission of building a market and crisis resilient community economic empowerment and social security strategy and scheme focused on marginalization and rural poverty. This is easier said than done. Over the past four years, trying to build a cooperative enterprise, unity and cooperation has been one of the most challenging issues I have had to face as a business head and community member. Um, and this is a challenge that spans multiple mental levels. Next slide, please. I started from the social enterprise models I learned from the free business development courses and mentorship programs that were provided by my alma mater, Liverpool Hope University. This combined with the radical critical perspectives and action orientation promoted by my Department of Social Work and Justice, birthed the activist entrepreneur at an ethical brand I am upcycled. Uh, with time, I started to lose my affinity towards the term social enterprise. This is due to the lack of comprehensive regulations and standards as to what is a social enterprise. As I'm immersed in the Sri Lankan social enterprise ecosystem, I continue to witness the various forms that social enterprises take and their shortfall in really addressing social and environmental issues. This is further enriched by my presence in grassroots uh, supply chains as a producer, supplier and trader. I also adopt a social worker perspective in my work where I consider the private endeavors of green life generation as a blueprint for what public endeavors that strive for social and environmental justice should adopt and vice versa. 
This is built on the socialist feminist view of the personal is political and any lasting change requires a concurrent bottom up and top down approach. As overcoming exploitation was key to the business model, workplace democracy and the cooperative business model was the one that was immediately, I was immediately attracted to. Initially, I took the Spanish Mondragon cooperation model. The core principle for Mondragon on top of democratic control and decision making was a secure employment policy. No one loses their job no matter what happens. This is one of the core principles that I adopted into GLG social model right at the start, moving market risk and vulnerability to external shocks away from the workers to the company. While I was able to move the women employed in the company away from insecure self-employment schemes to secure flexible and decent employment model, I was now self-employed, also without the right to work, actually, as I am a foreign resident in Sri Lanka now. I was also placed within a an insecure market and vulnerable to shock and crisis. This is where my marginalization and vulnerability as a female entrepreneur and migrant worker building a rural SME emerged, pushing me into crisis mode, but also providing me the opportunity to build a more resilient and sustainable model for grassroots economic transformation, disaster readiness, and resilience. Next slide, please. I consider the latest version of my model you see here as a holistic grassroots sustainable solution that can be implemented as a SME with both mitigation and adoption built in. Here, the social innovation is the 3E model of building employment, education, and entrepreneurship into one business model through a lifelong work-based learning program under the umbrella organization of social research, sustainable development, and alternative education. The key here is the sustainable development framework governed by a problem-based learning practice, driving co-creation and innovation with two main constraints built in, a mission for zero emissions and a mission for zero waste. And currently we are working uh, with construction waste and all our product designs and developments are based under these two constraints. On the social side, I target mainly marginalized and vulnerable groups uh, for employment and those who are from uh, who are marginalized from the traditional labor force and have been um, have uh, had have, have faced a disruption of their education or professional de development due to poverty. And within this lifelong work-based learning program, um, I have defined in a vertical and horizontal labor mobility so that we address the issue of labor stagnation and um, marginalization. Next slide, please. As identified in my research, the only available options for women economic empowerment is free capacity building programs, selected material support, and access to debt financing for the enterprise. This is where I have seen the emergence of what I describe as the think tank class and the working class. While initially I engaged in my PhD studies to become a consultant who can influence decision making, my position within a rural SME faced with geographical constraints as well as the the lower side of the digital divide keeps my model and financial needs hidden from potential funders. On the other hand, capital city-based think tanks continue to get their paychecks from funders and donors for capacity building and advocacy programs that address exactly the issues we in the grassroots, if empowered with the right support, can address ourselves. So this brings me to the question of how can we drive sustainable, sustainable at, and tech inclusive growth by enabling grassroots solutions to be developed by not driving them into risky forms of financing that create probably the collapse of all uh, these kind of uh, developing SMEs and the families that are dependent on this, but uh, direct them towards secure grants and investment. Um, I have this picture here, which is you know just some grants that we didn't get and a project that is still on the uh, pipeline. Uh, next slide, please, Alicia. And I end with this slide, which is a picture from last week as Sri Lanka uh, came back out of lockdown. And this is a queue of people waiting to get their passports to leave the country. So what I want to leave you with, if this is the queue of people waiting to leave at the end of this economic crisis that we are facing with cor the coronavirus pandemic, imagine what with the climate risk that we are in 
uh, what sort of outflows that we, we might have to face in those situations. Thank you. Thank you, Savandi. Uh, another really interesting and very different presentation. Um, and there are a few questions. We've got time for probably two or three before we stop for a break. So if I can put a couple of those to you, if anybody has any others that they'd like to put in the chat, please do. Um, I think one of the first questions to come to is one that you actually posed yourself, which is how do we get governments to buy into these grassroots organisations rather than give the funding to pre-existing businesses? Yeah, so this is, this is the challenge and uh, just getting, especially now with the digital divide and like this geographical divide, the uh, in, in Sri Lanka mainly it's it's the networks and who you know that kind of gets your voice out and heard. So if we can um, kind of build more localized, give more decentralized uh, government decision-making, give more power to the local authorities and uh, more, uh, even, even the funding agencies, if they work more direct with the local agencies and um, it needs to be more localized uh, rather than the current centralized aspect and the fact that the things are always around the capital and who is in the networks in the capital. So uh, at least I have the ability to speak in English and at come into these kind of forums to, to raise my voice. But imagine the people who, especially the farmers, um, the rural farmers who they know what needs to be done. They have experiences, but they don't have the capacity, the digital capacity or the language capacity to get their voice heard. And um, so there are a lot of challenges. So I think more uh, distributed, localized, um, um, devolved system. And that's quite challenging in Sri Lanka for, for many reasons. That's really interesting. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay. And one final question then. Um, you talked about unfree labor as almost a separate thing to modern slavery. And there's a really interesting context there. I wanted to ask about do you think it's only modern slavery if there's an identifiable perpetrator and a victim? And then is it unfree labor when it's a victim, but with um, a context that isn't necessarily implemented by an individual perpetrator? Um, I think the, um, the perpetrators are all there. And I guess like the, the, um, the reason that I am hesitant to use the word slave is like I said, the 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 empowerment that these people feel within themselves and then um, the even when i use the term unfree labor it's the the con the perpetrators are still there but the perpetrators are created by the system of unfreedom rather than um, uh, it, it, the system creates the perpetrators rather than the perpetrators are just individual incidences so i guess um, and th this is um, something that uh, you know, I've had to think deep too. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really in-depth and not an easy one to answer, I think. And uh, I think there's a lot of research going on to that. So I was really interested in your opinion on that. Um, okay, well, there is another question. So I'll put that to you because we have got a few more minutes um, and then we'll wrap up and have a break. So this question comes from Paul. And uh, he asks, is there any link with the communities who are indentured labourers working in the candy plantations? Do they slip into the forms you have mentioned in your study? That's it's interesting that uh, you asked that question, because actually what inspired my research was um, um, the, the, the people from these communities who were brought from the uh, by the British during colonial times at indentured laborers to work in these communities uh, in the tea plantations uh, and um, who inspired my work was we, we we used to call them servants um, a girl who was my age when I was 16 who was brought to my work house to work as a domestic worker so she was my age but she was working as a domestic worker whereas I was having all these opportunities and uh, you know getting education and things so this inequality still exists to this day and this inequality I identified when I came to England and when I used to tell people uh, we have servants uh, 
people were shocked and they would say what well, what and i didn't I, I that's what kind of took me out of my shell and showed me what that this is there's something wrong with this system and uh, kind of inspired me to work towards breaking this and um within migrant women um a lot of women are from these estate communities as well because they are uh, they are in abject poverty they are still kind of controlled by the tea estate uh, owners the and they were disenfranchised for a long time um where which meant they didn't have any property rights and they are there are generations that are still kind of um struggling to get out of the poverty that this the initial disenfranchisement caused for them so yeah they are the most vulnerable group in in sri lankan society at the moment thank you um you've given some really great answers there and a, a really interesting presentation so thanks again um, there is a, a message in the chat for you, Savandi, from Kameshri, who'd like to get in touch. So I'll, I'll leave you to take their email address and get in touch directly. But before I um, pass back over to Sophia, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all our panellists, Beth and James and Savandi, who have given us case study examples and, and their own personal research on India and Ghana and Sri Lanka and some really fascinating insights and I've answered some really interesting questions as well. So thank you to everybody. And I'll pass over to Sophia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth, James, Savandi and, and Alicia for that really fascinating panel discussion. You, um, you certainly covered a lot of ground there. 